Welcome everyone to the fourth session of our Climate Health and Healthcare Speaker Series. We're so excited today to have three wonderful speakers here, Anita Rao, Raluca Radu, and Samantha Green, who will be discussing environmental advocacy for healthcare learners. Uh, so if you have attended previous sessions, tonight is going to work very similarly. So our three speakers are going to give their talks and at the end we will do a short Q&A uh, session. So feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box or message them to either Vienna or I throughout the talk and we'll make sure that we answer them during the question period. And as a reminder, participants who attend four of six sessions and write a short reflection at the end of the series are eligible to receive a certificate for their participation. And we'll be sending out more information about the reflection requirements for the certificate via email over the next couple days. So before we get started, we want to take this opportunity for a land acknowledgement. So we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to learn and to work on this land. So without further ado, I think Vienna is going to introduce our first speaker. Yeah, so our first speaker is Samantha Green, and she's a family physician at St. Michael's Hospital and with Inner City Health Associates. Sorry. And with Inner City... Sorry about that. She's So she's a family physician at St. Michael's Hospital and with Inner City Health Associates, assistant professor at the University of Toronto and faculty lead in climate change and health in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. She sits on the board of directors of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment and is past chair of the Health Providers Against Poverty. And you can go ahead whenever you're ready. Perfect, thank you. Um, yeah, sorry, I took over the screen share. I wanted to make sure it was working. Um, uh, so I'll just jump right in. I don't have any financial disclosures. As you heard, I am a board member, volunteer board member with uh, CAPE, Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. Um, and I also always want to um, uh, approach, mention that I approach these concepts uh, from my position of privilege as a physician and my specific social locations and experiences that inform my work but can also contribute to my own blind spots. Uh, so I'm going to dive in and give a bit of an introduction to advocacy and then give a few examples from my own advocacy work. Um, so this is um, a definition. Advocacy is about power. It means influencing those who have power on behalf of those who do not. Uh, I like this definition, but there are many other definitions out there. And um, yeah, if you have any comments about this definition, please feel free to uh, put them in the chat if you think anything is missing. Um, another, another definition I've heard is uh, work that changes the course of history, which I quite, I quite like. Um, so uh, why should we as healthcare professionals engage in advocacy? Well, uh, you've probably seen this quite ancient <laughs> infographic before, uh, ancient at this point, I think it's 10 years old from the Canadian Medical Association, Association uh, which shows that just 25% of someone's health is actually determined by the health care that we provide in the healthcare system. About 50% is determined by the social determinants of health, 15% is like genetics, and then 10% is the environment. Uh, and then you may have also seen this uh, graphic, which I think uh, draws better attention to the importance of the ecological determinants of health, which really underpin the social and structural determinants. And we cannot have or address, sorry, we cannot address the social and structural determinants of health without first also addressing the ecological determinants of health. And as you know from this series, climate change is the number one health threat of this century. I mean, just in the last 12 months, at just one point, two degrees of warming. Across the country, we've, we've experienced the devastating heat dome that killed over 700 people in BC, extensive flooding across BC and Newfoundland, devastating forest fires in BC and uh, Northern Ontario, and drought across the prairies that have contributed to increasing food prices. And as I'm sure you're aware, we are currently on track for double the agreed upon 1.5 degrees of warming by the end of this century. Um, we need to act now uh, to actually limit warming to, you know, what, what the countries of the world have agreed upon. Another reason to engage in advocacy or another way to frame it is that health is actually political. Um, so if we think of like a typical example of 
you know, patient in front of you with poorly controlled diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, maybe some vascular complications. Uh, you know, we can often attribute these problems to social determinants of health, like food insecurity, barriers to exercise, and of course, chronic stress. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, those social determinants are actually determined by politics. So for example, economic policy, like the extremely embarrassingly low OW and ODSP rates. Uh, and we can apply this to climate change and, and other ecological determinants of health as well. So we can just, you know, ha have an example of a patient in front of us with poorly controlled asthma, eczema, environmental allergies, so the typical ATP triad. Um, and we can think of, you know, ecological and social determinants of health that contribute to that. So like traffic related air pollution. And we know that people living in poverty and racialized people are more exposed to air pollution in general. We can think of industrial air pollution, wildfire smoke, extreme heat. Maybe the patient is an outdoor worker who doesn't have a choice in the exposure that they experience, no air conditioning at home. And obviously, ultimately it's politics, right? It's ongoing investment in oil and gas extraction and consumption and policies that we base around maximizing GDP instead of wellness. And so advocacy is actually a professional responsibility and you know it is one of the CanMed's roles. Um, so it's something that we should do for moral reasons. It's something that we should do because actually um, it, that's what's gonna help improve the population's health. And also it's, it's one of our responsibilities as, as physicians. Um, and how do we contribute as healthcare providers? We are respected and, and we're often a surprise voice. Often people don't expect to hear from us. We have relative job security compared to many other people who engage in advocacy. Um, we also have close connection to individuals who are marginalized in a unique way. And we have the ability to then um, highlight and um, uplift people's stories. Um, we have an understanding and authority to speak to research evidence. And then sometimes we have the ability to steer or solicit funding. Um, we are also specifically trusted voices on climate change. You may have seen this data before from uh, climate communication scientist Edward Maybach. And what he has said is that we need simple, clear messages repeated often by a variety of trusted voices to affect change on the climate crisis. And you can see we are trusted voices. So primary care doctors are the most trusted voices specifically on climate change. A final reason to engage in advocacy is it is fun and rewarding. Um, we hold a unique position as health professionals where we can build relationships with patients and intervene to improve health at the macro, or sorry, at the micro level. And we can witness direct improvements in health patient by patient, day by day. And we can also engage in advocacy, which is overall a very slow process, but which can have an enormous impact if successful. And, and it, personally, I, I take great joy and satisfaction in, in engaging in both levels of, of change making. Um, and this is just me uh, at Climate March in September of 2019. Um, and specifically around climate change, uh, as health professionals, we also have a unique role to play in advocating for climate mitigation policies that have health co-benefits. Uh, and people really like hearing good news, especially when it comes to climate change. So we have this role to actually uh, highlight these health co-benefits that we will see from climate action. And this is just from the WHO a few years ago, meeting the targets of the Paris Climate Agreement would be expected to save over 1 million lives a year from air pollution alone by 2050. Um, and you know, the Lancet has called climate change the greatest health threat of the century. It has also called uh, climate change the greatest health opportunity. And so, for example, we can advocate for bike lanes and improve access to public transit, which of course we know is good for people's physical health and mental health. We can advocate for urban green programs that provide access to nature and also mitigate the urban heat island effect, uh, and also obviously act as carbon sinks. And we can promote sustainable food systems and plant-rich diets. Uh, and now I'll just kind of jump into some specific examples as well. So at CAPE, uh, we contributed to some successful advocacy that led to a ban on coal-fired fired power plants um, here in Ontario and Alberta. And that was a win for both the climate and then also for current levels of air pollution. Um, oops. We've seen um, a reduction of smog days from uh, a high of 53 in 2005 to none since the last coal-fired power plant shut down in 2014. Um, 
And, and you know, this is, it's also an obligation that many have called on, on us as health professionals to engage in, in social protests to protect people from the climate and ecological emergency. Uh, so this is Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, um, calling for that. Um, and, and we can all, sorry, I don't know why it's moving on its own. Um, we can all take action on climate change, you know, beyond personal choices, beyond sustainable health care. Um, and we can start by talking to our friends, family, neighbors, political representatives about the health impacts of the climate crisis. And really, we can equate climate change with a health emergency, because most people still think of it as a polar bear problem and not a people problem. Um, and we can advocate with all our political representatives to treat climate change as the health emergency it is. Um, and uh, how much time do I have? Oh, not very much time. I just wanted to introduce, and, and I can get into um, more of this. Uh, um, I mean, obviously it's very busy, but uh, if there's time later. Um, but, um, you know, when we think about, so I've talked a lot about why, um, but I haven't really gotten into the how. Um, and uh, this uh, is a toolkit that was developed, uh, that I, I helped develop in my family health team. It's a little bit old now, 2017, um, but it's a step-by-step -step toolkit, which I am happy to share with everyone here um, uh, on how to engage in advocacy. Um, and I'll just uh, zoom out. So five simple steps, um, uh, identify the issue, Step two, which is really important and isn't necessarily very obvious, connect with allies. So join a coalition or build your own. Step three is set an objective and a target. So your objective is like what policy change you wanna see and your target is who's gonna do it. Um, and then step four is choose your strategy and tools. And that's kind of like what we think of as advocacy. Like I'm gonna write an op-ed, uh, I'm gonna go and do a protest at parliament. And then step five is implement and then also evaluate, which we don't always do. Um, Anyways, uh, I can go through this in detail, but I won't do that right now. Um, but like I said, I'm very happy to share the toolkit. Um, and the nice thing about the toolkit is it has appendices with detailed examples from each, um, each of these steps. Uh, so as I said, I, um, I can share that later. Um, the other thing just to underpin all of this is obviously as health professionals, we should always be evidence-based um, and to just go for it, to be bold and, and get involved. So just a couple of additional examples. Um, right currently at CAPE, um, we have um, we are working with EcoJustice um, on uh, uh, advocacy to ban the export of thermal coal. Currently, um, the federal government has um, a plan to shut down all coal-fired power plants across the country by 2030. Um, but uh, we are still exporting it uh, so that it can be burned and cause air pollution related illness and death in other countries. Um, and so, never mind the climate change impacts, of course. So, uh, we are engaged in this advocacy to put an end to exporting thermal coal. And actually, this advocacy did lead to the Liberal Party putting it in their platform with the federal election. So, we'll see if they follow through on that promise. Um, we are also advocating um, for an end to the use of natural gas in homes um, and, and really speaking to the health impacts of cooking with gas in particular. And you may have heard more about it because it's actually been given some media attention recently in the CBC, um, just like the link between cooking with natural gas and um, the development of asthma in kids, for example, um, and asthma exacerbations as well. We've also been working on divestment and, and we were successful in advocating that the CMA divest from fossil fuel investments, since we know fossil fuels kill more people than tobacco. Uh, and then locally here in Ontario, um, we've been doing some advocacy around sprawl because we know, you know, in addition to the obvious climate impacts that sprawl is bad for health, um, more time spent in a car actually is linked with death, like obesity, cardiovascular disease, but also overall increased mortality. Um, plus there are the air pollution impacts of a new highway. So we've been advocating um, against the proposed new 413 and Bradford bypass highways um, that the Ford government would like to build through farmland and wetlands. Um, <laughs> And finally, I'm almost done. This is my last slide. Um, uh, at CAPE, we have also joined up, um, you know, to highlight step two in the um, toolkit. Uh, we have joined up with over a hundred organizations at the moment, um, hoping for more in the Ontario Climate Emergency Campaign. And you can go to the website, ontarioclimateemergency.ca. Um, and uh, you can see we've developed a 12 point action plan that the provincial government we hope we'll take 
uh, you know, the new government after June 2nd, um, to treat climate change, like I said, as the emergency that it is. Um, and so we have groups, um, you know, uh, of course, environmental groups, labor, also faith communities, um, businesses. Um, so yeah, if you're part of a group, like if you're a member of a church, um, or if you're a part of, um, you know, a community group, of any kind, please visit the website and see if you want to sign on because uh, we are officially launching uh, in less than two weeks um, and we're hoping to have 200 groups by then. Um, we're having a press conference and that is it. So this was the toolkit. And like I said, I'm happy to share that. Perfect, thank you so much. And I think there were a lot of great links that you were mentioning. So we would love if you could drop those in the chat um, so that people can access that. Um, that would be wonderful. So I'm going to introduce our next speaker. So we have Raluca Radu, who is a nursing professional working as a lecturer at the University of British Columbia School of Nursing in Vancouver, where she teaches the BSN program and leads a health impacts of climate change course taught to undergraduate students from diverse disciplines. Um, Ms. Radu is a past board member of the Canadian Association for Nurses for the Environment, but she still maintains an active membership role at the national and provincial levels. Uh, at an international scale, she's involved with the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education Nursing Working Group, um, and she's been instrumental in advancing knowledge situated at the intersection of climate change and human health as a result of her involvement in the academic and NGO sectors, which has supported her ongoing growth in this sphere. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just going to start sharing my screen and hopefully everybody can see this okay. Looks uh, great. Awesome, great. Uh, good evening, good afternoon to everybody joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be able to offer a perspective from uh, a nurse's point of view on what I see advocacy as. I'm um, just sorry, just getting my slides sorted there. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in. And I just want to say that I really appreciated the introduction provided by Dr. Green, uh, because I thought it was a very good preface into hopefully what I'm going to speak. Um, and I just want to start off by saying that I am very feeling very privileged and honored to be able to be joining you all from the land of the unceded, unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations uh, here, also known as Vancouver, BC. So thank you again for having me. Um, so I'm gonna dive right into advocacy and actually uh, throw in some perspectives that are shared from the Canadian Nurses Association. And these are quite recent um, as to how, from a nursing perspective, we understand advocacy work. And I know that there, there are similar parallels with uh, what Dr. Green had mentioned earlier in her presentation. But as you'll note, you know, historically nurses have been advocates on multiple perspectives and platforms, be it in clinical settings or policy education or in the community where they work. And so I really do feel strongly that it is in our blood as nurses and also in general as healthcare providers to advocate on behalf of our clients, regardless of the context where we practice. And I also think that it, it takes certain uh, qualities uh, to be an advocate, but I also just want to emphasize that uh, engaging in advocacy can take on many shapes and forms. And it's, it's, I think that's what's really critical is my send off message to you that I hope to instill by the end of my presentation is that um, you can be an advocate in uh, multiple areas and maybe not even be aware of it. So, um, you know, it takes a lot of courage, it takes passion and devotion for what you're interested in pursuing. And it takes that need and want to disrupt the status quo and to actually be able to have the open mindedness to facilitate something on behalf of somebody else who may not have the same um, authority or power or voice. Um, so that's why we as healthcare professionals are perfectly positioned to be able to advocate on behalf of our, of our patients. So as you'll note from the CNA, um, it is about exercising our voices. It is about participating both directly and indirectly in political processes uh, of whether it is through mobilizing evidence that can influence policy and in our practices, or whether that is by acknowledging, um, as Dr. Green had mentioned as well, that evidence is critical, um, that power and politics are again, a very important uh, parts of how that becomes to advance uh, policy options and how that gets to influence decision making. And in the sphere of this, I do want to emphasize that although I know previous colleagues in the past cascade sessions have emphasized on how we need to look at climate change through um, the social determinants of health perspective and understand that equity needs to be pinpointed at the center of the work that we undertake. We also need to understand that climate change um, is, 
is severely uh, intertwined with how, for instance, certain groups experience different levels of vulnerability and marginalization, such as individuals who may experience homelessness or individuals who may be displaced because of climate change related events. Um, we need to then kind of turn our attention as this diagram points to us, the, what are the vulnerability factors that are impacting those specific groups are the demographic or geographic um, and then what are the exposure pathways that they are interrelated with? So things like, for instance, heat stress, or if air quality is impaired, or if there's a different a distribution of vectors, especially with a warming climate. And then in, in return to that, how do health systems and uh, governing systems have the capacity and the resilience to respond to these events? So is there an adequate and staff and well-staffed and trained workforce to respond to these events? Uh, do we have enough financing available to support such responses? Um, do we have enough uh, delivery of services that can actually respond when we have natural disasters and so forth? So we really need to look at it from a 360 degree lens. And then of course, we need to look at what those climate sensitive health risks are and who is impacted the most. So we know that all of these health outcomes, which I know that you would have learned about in the earlier session when you received the introduction to the health effects of climate change, I just want to highlight the fact that these health outcomes will, of course, be experienced differently by individuals who may belong to groups that have increased vulnerability and hence with climate change, they will have exacerbations in the conditions that they're already living with. So it's very important uh, for us to not silo out these components, but rather see, a, see at them as kind of like an umbrella that encompasses all of these intricate and complex factors, which is why, of course, we refer to climate change is a wicked problem um, that doesn't have just one way solution. And so that brings me to the notion of climate advocacy and just a call for everyone to understand that it's multi-layered and it does require a transdisciplinary approach. Uh, I'm very fortunate in my nursing to 90 class here at UBC to teach students about the need to look at this from a micro, meso, macro perspective. So um, what that means is that at the micro level, we need to emphasize that individuals have the capacity and power to enact change, but that change can be trickled into how they can influence in their community and groups, family members and so forth to kind of enact on the same change and join up and to forces. Because when we know that when we build or rather when we promote pro-social behaviors among individuals, we start contributing to increase social cohesion and social cohesion then leads to trust building. And then when you have a community that has trust, um, there is more likely to be um, this energy and push towards change. And I think that that will then trickle into this macro approach where as a society, at the political, economical and social factor levels, um, we get to push and influence our governments to try to uh, make the changes that are necessary to green our countries and to build more sustainable healthcare systems. So I want to dive straight into um, some examples and ways to which people can start getting involved like today. And I want to start off with CANE, uh, the Canadian Association of Nurses for the Environment, and where I'm very happy to now sit more actively at the British Columbia level. Um, I had a very great two years as a secretary. Um, and I have to say that they're a fantastic group of people um, because Kane represents nurses, not only from all designations, but from all areas of practice. And they really try to empower and inspire, inspire nurses to um, improve planetary health across all domains of nursing practice, policy, research, education. And so I really hope that um, we will be able to increase our membership because we already have coast to coast representation, but we, you know, we can never have too many members and I high, strongly encourage you to consider joining. Um, as you can note here from a uh, um, picture I took from their website is that Kane is responsible for facilitating, supporting, influencing and promoting all aspects that are related to planetary health in general. Um, they do a lot of advocacy and, uh, you know, we've been a lot, we, I know we've built a lot of a strong coalition with CAPE uh, along the years and are grateful for our partnership in that regard, because especially that's, that's been a, a huge contributor to some of the petitions that were signed and some of the policy decisions that are being taken at the governmental level. So I think that it's a fantastic platform if you want to be introduced to what advocacy work is like. And moreover, they also have incredible committees such as the Intersectionality and the Truth and Reconciliation Committee that essentially are adopting a stance of intersectionality in their work in order to see the um, struggle of other oppressed groups and to work towards a culture that creates safer and more inclusive spaces for all. 
Um, and they have an education subcommittee group that, again, is trying to make a push for change in curricula and healthcare education, and the public relations group that is also working on building connections and enhancing the, those connections as we've done with Cape and as we've done with our allies from the United States. So um, just to kind of uh, segue into another piece, this is, again, a screenshot from some of the work that we do at Cape. Um, and uh, there is way more if you go to our website, but um, as you notice at the top left corner that TWU is actually a Trinity Western University, which is a school here, a school of nursing, um, their school of nursing in the lower mainland has actually taken the pledge uh, for planetary health on World Health Day. And as you'll notice, and I know Dr. Yoon mentioned it as well, uh, there is a campaign going around around uh, trying to influence people to sh shift away from uh, gas-based uh, appliances and move more towards the electric ones that are more healthy for the environment and also for families and children. Um, so these are just a kind of a few of the many examples. And I feel like I'm still not doing justice with the incredible work that's being undertaken at Kane. So hopefully th this has been enough of a speech to inspire you to join. Um, segue into a couple more clinical-based examples because I want to show you that, again, advocacy takes on many forms. Um, I've had the privilege of being connected to BC Green Care, who works very closely with uh, here in BC with the Lower Mainland Health Authorities. Um, so these are two examples from the practice where I'm sure many of you are probably already familiar with the, with the incredible Dr. Chada, but um, she states here that the Green Corner section, which is part of a Vancouver General Hospital Hospital Psychiatric Newsletter, and there's a Spark platform pilot that is also part of the OR that's getting people involved and getting people talking about these issues. And similarly, you have um, Diane Chan below who spoke about collecting 500 boxes of expired wound and IV supplies and finding ways to repurpose this waste so that it's not actually contributing to more environmental damage. Um, and in, in the same kind of manner, we, we have these incredible two nurses who actually um, took action at reducing plastic waste and took uh, the form as to, to talking about this with their authority supply chain and the green uh, care energy and environmental sustainability team to kind of inspire province-wide uh, green changes, as you'll note here with the reduction of the use of the sit basins that are used um, in, uh, in the maternity wards there. So again, it's just real people just like you and I who are out there uh, at the front line and who are undertaking these practice changes. And, you know, I really do believe that it just takes one person to, to start to inspire trickle down effects, domino effects that I think can kind of have impact in the long run as well. Um, this is just another example of another incredible registered nurse who's actually decided to um, commute by bicycle and Evo car sharing here in the lower mainland whenever she's uh, visiting uh, the community clients uh, as a quick response nurse. And again, I think it's incredible that um, I feel like you can be kind of inspired just by actually hearing about these examples and trying to minimize our footprint. Um, I'm also fortunate to share um, this example that has actually just come off the press uh, literally a few days ago, but this is a toolkit that was designed and developed by a graduate student of mine, Natanya Abebe, who um, has essentially also filmed the documentary and I will ask my colleagues to post a link to um, how they can access this toolkit and the film. But it's again, another beautiful way that portrays how a graduate nursing student has been able to focus on the mental health impacts of climate change and to try to equip students with tools specifically through reflective-based learning um, as to how they can kind of conquer the fears around how climate is changing, how it's affecting us, and to try to move from a state of eco-paralysis into more of an action state. So I strongly recommend watching that film that also features Dr. Lem and Dr. Courtney Howard and several of my students from past iterations of the climate change course I teach. Um, and I'm just coming close to the very end, but this is just a slide um, that showcases some of the different other forms of advocacy work that I've embarked on, uh, be it the case study that I've just developed uh, with my course on wildfires in British Columbia, um, or if it's writing an op-ed with a colleague like Helen Boyd, um, or being a part of uh, designing a policy statement with the Nursing Association. I've been in this sphere for only three years, so I just want to emphasize that you don't you don't need to have a degree in this. You can start today. If you're passionate about protecting your environment and what surrounds it and how the health of yourself and others will be influenced in the future, I feel that you can start as soon as today 
Um, and the best way to start is by um, you know, joining groups like Cascade, the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare, joining CAVE, joining CANE, um, using these free re resources that are out there to educate yourself and inform yourself of all the ways that, um, you know, whether you're passionate about air quality or maybe you're passionate about biodiversity protection. Um, I think there's so many ways to, to become acquainted with this information for free. Um, and again, I'm happy to share these slides with the audience as I realize I'm zooming past them. Um, but in the end, really, it just boils down to this, um, and it aligns with the Planetary Health Pledge for health professionals. As mediators between science policy and practice, and also as trained communicators, I will highlight communicators, health professionals are well-placed to become agents of individual and systemic transformative changes. And that's the only way to essentially increase uh, resilience to environmental uh, changes and reduce our ecological footprints of societies. So I'm happy to stay connected with you. Please feel free to follow me on social media. And it's been a pleasure to be able to share this platform with such incredible speakers. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was a great talk. That was, we really enjoyed that. Um, and either you can share the links or we can share them as well with the audience through the chat. Um, we're going to move on to our final speaker for today. And that is Anita Rao, who is an anesthesiologist at Trillium Health Partners. After several years of general environmental activism, she found that she could make a greater impact with targeted advoc advocacy in healthcare. Her specific interests are in greening surgical care and the high resource intensive operating room environment. Okay, you can all see my slides all right? Yeah, looks great. Okay, perfect. So um, thanks very much for inviting me. This is a great privilege for me to be speaking to students. Um, I am at a uh, large community hospital, but we are associated with a uh, medical, uh, with one of the U of T medical schools, the Mississauga Academy of Medicine. So, um, oh, there we go, I'm sorry. So uh, I think um, uh, Samantha and uh, Raluca have already gone over why we have a clinical obligation um, within our professions to advocate for sustainability. And that's because part of the efforts we, we engage in treating individual pa patients actually create pollutants and conditions that harm the health of populations. I work in a high resource environment. I work in a tertiary care center. And we use a lot of resources to treat individual patients. We create a lot of waste and we produce a lot of pollutants in terms of pharmaceutical waste and in terms of emissions. And so we do have a moral obligation to green our system whenever we can. Uh, as healthcare learners, I think really you are the ideal advocates. First of all, um, as far as nursing students and medical students, you have a wide exposure to several areas of healthcare. You go from primary care to tertiary care, you go out to the community, population health, and many of you in this audience, because you're here, you view through a sustainability lens already. So you can look for those areas of change within your working environment. You're also expert learners. You rapidly absorb and analyze information. And really you are the future because at every core process change, we will have environment at the center of that. And that will be coming. I didn't grow up that way where environmental sustainability should be the focus of almost every decision, but that will be what will happen in your careers. So I was asked to give uh, an example of advocacy um, that we've implemented or uh, a project that we've implemented as well as some advocacy. And I'm just gonna bring one ongoing project that we've been working on and that's about anesthetic gases. So the, uh, for those of you who may or may not be familiar with, the, with anesthetic gases, they're medications that are used by patients. Sorry, they're used by anesthetists to keep patients asleep. A patient will inhale them usually through a breathing tube. They're maintained throughout the course of a surgery and then they're exhaled by the patient at the end of surgery. They're collected from the OR so that the OR personnel don't fall asleep and they're vented directly to the atmosphere unchanged. They are potent hydrochlorofluorocarbons. So they are um, gases that in a different context, either through industry or chemical production would be subject to carbon pricing, but anesthetic gases themselves are exempt. 
They are the number one source of operating room emissions, about 25% of all emissions from the operating room, including energy and supply chain is from anesthetic gases, and they contribute a full 5% of total greenhouse gases from, from healthcare. And as you uh, know from Dr. McNeil's um, study that can, uh, Canada's uh, healthcare contribution to uh, our global greenhouse gas emission is 4.6%. So anesthetic gases alone contribute about 0.2% of all of the greenhouse gases um, produced in Canada in a year. Almost all of these emissions are from one agent, which is called desflurane, which has a global warming potential of over 2,500. So um, there are a few different anesthetic gases. There are mainly only two that are used now. One is desflurane, the other is called sevaflurane. 15 years worth of published research has shown that desflurane is extremely destructive to the environment. But despite knowing this, education has not really been sufficient to change behavior. Um, we have drastically reduced how much desflurane we use in, in North America, but in other jurisdictions such as the NHS where they've completely gotten rid of it, um, we are still far behind. It's still used in about 12% of all anesthetics across the country. And because it's so toxic, it actually is a significant contributor to greenhouse gases. So um, there's a few different ways that uh, several of us across the country have approached this problem. One is um, local change in our operating rooms. And I'll just give an example in our operating room in Mississauga. In 2019, we started um, just with small educational rounds presenting data on the uh, destructive power of desflurane. About in our, my hospital site, we had about 20 anesthesiologists and about 10 used it regularly. And we did that, just peppered it in in every one of our department meetings, how much we were using, how we could reduce. Then that after a year of that, um, I had discussions with individual colleagues in 2020, we um, instituted a new uh, health management system, EPIC, and I was the lead. So I had the unique opportunity to actually go into the rooms of my colleagues and um, help them with the new health management system and also to have individual conversations. We converted about another 40% of those who weren't using it before. Then in 2021, we were after a lot of deliberation, our um, chief decided to actually have a uh, sort of an automated function where we would take these cartridges that are required to use desflurane out of the rooms. So this was a sort of a step-by-step -step QI initiative. And so only those people that were really motivated would have to actually go and find these cartridges and, and uh, to use them. Finally, in February 2022, we still had about 10% um, uh, of our users using desflurane regularly. We actually got permission from our uh, corporate chief, as well as from pharmacy and therapeutics, and we got rid of it completely in our health system. I work in a city of over 800,000 people, and so I'm very proud to say that as of February 2022, we are completely desflurane free. So um, just to give you an idea of the magnitude of this change in um, just in my center, we, uh, we have three centers in our health system. In 2019, we emitted 441 tons of CO2, which is 740 round trip flights from Toronto to London. And now that we're replacing all of the desflurane with the less harmful gas, we are only going to be emitting 28 tons of CO2, which is 16 fold reduction. And incidentally, we are also going to save 30% from our budget. Um, so this is how we approach this on a, uh, uh, on a local level. This has been replicated in a few other hospitals in Ontario and Sudbury Health Sciences North was the first one, St. Joseph's Health Center in Toronto um, followed. And each center requires two to three years to follow the same process. And as you can see, it's not very efficient. So along with this, parallel to this, we were advocating for wider system change. And one of these changes was to um, try to get desflurane really out of the uh, Canadian landscape. So we partnered with anesthesiologists across the country to lobby M to MPs, as well in Ontario, we lobby NPPs, and we have been trying to meet with ECCC. 
we've partnered with influential environmental groups, such as Citizens, Citizens Climate Lobby, which does a lot of work on carbon pricing. And we've tried to come with a specific solution. Part of our problem is this is at the intersection of the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of the Environment. One of the things that anesthetic gases is, is, it's, is it is a scope one emission, but we are not required to report it in the greenhouse of gas inventory of hospitals. There's two reasons for this. One is it was felt that it is medically necessary, um, that uh, anesthesia drugs are medically necessary, but the destructive nature of desflurane isn't. And the other it was originally felt not to be a large contributor to greenhouse gases, which is also false. So we are actually trying to get data on how much anesthetic gas we, so we use. And we're trying to do that by lobbying to get anesthetic gases into the greenhouse gas inventory. And ultimately the goal would be to get carbon pricing on it. There are other, multi, there are other approaches where um, I'll be speaking at HealthPro, which is a group purchasing organization. Um, uh, their national sustainability uh, conference about um, why we should probably think about stopping to procure this uh, drug. So along the way, um, and I think this is the part where Dr. Green said this was really fun. I've got the opportunity to speak to lots of people, environmental lawyers, politicians, and academics. And it's really great to make connections outside of healthcare. People are very approachable. Um, and I actually just cold called a lot of them. And I've had the privilege of having a consultation with um, uh, Dr. Diane Sachs and um, many MPs offices. And we just recently met with the Attorney General of Canada. So one of the things all of these groups have said to us is, is, well, you're just a group of anesthesiologists. How do we know that your profession is behind you? So we sought explicit support. There are multiple best practice papers that say we should not be using this drug, including the Royal Federation of Anesthesiologists and the prestigious American Society of Anesthesiologists. So we approached Ontario's anesthesiologists, which is the section of the Ontario Medical Association, and they were highly supportive of putting a position statement on and gases to be included in the GHG inventory. And so from that, we actually got the only OMA endorsed statement on the environment last spring, and we use the statement all of the time in our meetings with MPs. So one of the things that I think is really important in advocacy is to anticipate barriers. And every time I try to anticipate barriers and write down all the possible questions that could be asked. There are always some new questions that I'm stumped by and there's always new barriers. So one of the things I do is I try to provide all the solutions and reassurances during our initial discussions. And there were several for these, um, for even just removing this drug from our hospital alone. And one of the other things is um, by nature, I'm not particularly patient, which is probably why I'm an anesthesiologist, but everything will take much longer than you expect. And certain implementations, I ha um, we have three right now going on at our hospital and I expected all of them to make it take about three months and they're probably all going to take a year. And so one of the challenges I have is not to let my delays lead to complacency. So every morning when I get up, I think, who am I going to email today about that project and how to do it in a non-offensive manner so I don't bother them too much. So we still have a lot of work to be done. Um, so individual efforts have really led to drastic reductions in depth fluorine use in Canada, but it's still being used. Uh, we're continuing to lobby MPs, but we're still waiting for our um, meeting with the ECCC. We are confident that if we get a meeting, this is such an easy political and environmental win um, that they would be willing to uh, consider in some way restricting the use. So as healthcare um, uh, change makers and as students, I think your real superpower is observation. You get to go into so many different environments and see where you can make a change. You're experts at becoming experts. You learn really quickly. And uh, you will just say to our students, oh, well, I don't know about this issue. Why don't you learn all about it and give us 20 minute presentation the next day? You really are good at uh, assimilating information and knowledge translation, and of course, action. You should feel empowered, whether you're a student or whether you're like me, who's been practicing for 25 years. We have agency and we have credibility and all you really need is an earnest desire to um, make the planet better. 
Um, one of the uh, most important things I've learned is really to share success. And I have a Cuba I background and besides just an environmental um, advocacy, it's really important to, to share successes and to collect data and to demonstrate the value of your implementation. And um, for those of you who are interested in publishing, really a lot of these sustainability initiatives, initiatives have great endpoints and they could all be QI projects and you can promote and publish. And I'm uh, very happy if anyone wants to ask me about specific organizations, um, especially about greening the OR or for anesthesia, please just uh, email me and um, your organizers have all my contacts. And I think that's it for me. Okay, thank you so much. So we're gonna move into a question and answer period. So as always, feel free to keep putting your um, questions in the chat. Um, so I think um, what we're gonna start with is a question for both of you. And that would be, do you have any advice or tips on approaching conversations about the importance of sustainability with the staff that you're working with as a learner? Because I know that, that can be maybe a challenging conversation. So maybe we'll get um, Dr. Rao, would you like to start and then we'll get Dr. Green? Sure, I think that's a great question. And uh, I, I think just say it, right? You should be empowered to say it. And if you see something that doesn't make sense to you, um, why are we using all this paper? Why are we duplicating? Why do the lights not turn off automatically? Why are you drinking out of a water bottle, right? Instead of, or why are you buying a water bottle instead of drinking out of your reusable cup? It is your future. And you have the ability to improve things. It's delicate, it, it's always delicate, and it really does depend on how well you're familiar with your circumstances and your environment. I've been working at my place for a long time, so I can just say what I think. But when you are a student and you're in a new environment, it is a little bit tricky, but you can always approach it. And again, I would say, but make sure you can back it up so you know what you're talking about. So if you say, you know, I don't understand why I have incandescent light bulbs in our call rooms. Well, find out who the facilities managers are, but you have to say, well, the LED bulbs cost this much and your return on investment will be in six to 12 months. Just know your data and so that they, they can't dismiss you. And if they do dismiss you, bring it up again in another way. It's tough. I understand it can be very de delicate as a student to do that. Yes, all great points. Um, I would also say, I mean, in any conversation like that with anyone, um, it's important to approach with curiosity, like the whole nonviolent communication style. Um, and and I agree with Anita, like always being based in, in evidence, um, having references is helpful. But I would also add, um, it can be helpful to, um, not do this as an individual um like especially if you're thinking about light bulbs like i would never try to do that as an individual because it'll just be frustrating and um a lot of work that won't get anywhere uh i think you have to do it as a member of a group so my first like step if you if you are interested in getting engaged in advocacy is to like join um you know cfms heart um or the local um you know environmental group in uh, the medical student society uh because there you're going to find your peers you're going to find ideas for action um you're going to find support um resources you'll also learn how to engage in advocacy because it's like a thing you need to do to learn um and therefore and by joining a group then you'll have mentors um and uh, like automatic advice about how to approach these things and like just for an i'll just give like one example i mean I, this was not as a student or anything but um you know when i joined the clinic where i work it was very clear we didn't recycle and i sent so many emails like and i made phone calls and i like talked to the manager and like i got nowhere and it was so frustrating and then in the summer of 2019 like a bunch of us decided to form a green team and like once we had a team a multidisciplinary team with like a nurse with a cleaner with like management represented 
then all of a sudden it happened like within a month, like, like, because we knew who to talk to, how to talk to them. Like, it's very complicated actually recycling. It's like such a, like, <laughs> I'd rather do anything else than talk about recycling really. Um, but anyway, so always better in a group. Okay, great. Thanks so much for answering that. It's really helpful to hear that kind of advice from both of you for sure. Um, I'm going to move on to a question from the Q&A, and I think this is related to Dr. Green's talk. So if there are known associations between things like natural gas and worsening asthma, why aren't policies being put into place more rapidly? Does it have to do with the lack of awareness? Oh, that's such a complicated uh, question. Uh, sure, yes, lack of awareness is part of it. I wouldn't say that's the end of the story, though. I mean, you know, like it's called natural gas. Like there are these enormous fossil fuel companies who have won big in the last, you know, hundred years uh, and um, just want to keep making money. And um, so they get to say, you know, um, yeah, anyway, so they, they, they have branded themselves in a certain way. Like it's methane, but we call it natural gas because that's what they've said we should call it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's like politics. Um, in addition to, you're right, like I think it hasn't been well known, the the, the health impacts of natural gas in the home. Um, uh, certainly it's news to like a lot of even, you know, my, my colleagues that um, having a natural gas stove can lead to asthma in kids. Um, and uh, so yeah, but I think there's more than that at play. So I think we need to engage in education and we also need to engage in, in advocacy um, and really fight back against like the big fossil fuel companies. Actually, I learned today, this is like a bit of an aside, sorry, but uh, I learned today that Enbridge and um, Fortis, which is like the equivalent of Enbridge in BC, like the big natural gas company, um, they are all members of a consortium, which is like literally called the Consortium to End Electrification. <laughs> So they have this like secret club where they are planning how to stop electrification from happening. Like it's pure evil. So um, anyways, uh, yeah, that's my answer. Sorry for going on and on. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Green. Um, so I think for Dr. Rao, there's a question in here talking about um, what is the current appeal for the current, for the, sorry, continued use of dust fluorine? So I guess wondering what kind of patient outcomes are observed with the next best alternative any data on this and what are your thoughts about this? Right, so there's about 20 years of data on this. Um, really, uh, desflurane came out into common use maybe about 20 years ago and it was marketed because it has a very fast onset and offset. So because of its volatility, it actually it's easily titratable. So really it's a convenience for the anesthesiologist. Um, it does have specific issues with it, it's an irritant, um, it's a bit of an irritant to the airway. So in fact, it's not great to induce pediatric patients or patients with COPD. It does induce, uh, this might be a bit technical for the, anyway, I'll, I'll just, I'll talk about it. It does induce a bit of tachycardia. So I, you know, I don't like to use it in patients with coronary artery disease. So it's a good question, why, why is desflurane still being used? And really the answer is, is when you turn it off, the patients wake up really quickly. The next um, best alternative, which is called sevaflurane, its global warming potential is 20 times lower than desflurane, lasts in the atmosphere for one year, as opposed to over 10 years for desflurane. So quite a bit less destruct destructive. It, is, it can be used for pediatric patients. It doesn't have the same tachycardia. It's a slower onset and offset. So you just have to turn it off quicker. Really, that's the only difference. There's multiple studies on patient outcomes. Desflurane Baxter has tried to show that it's better for obese patients, not true. Tried to show it's better for post-operative cognitive dysfunction, incorrect. Tried to show that it was better recovery. All they can come out with is that it's better for immediate recovery. So the patient's pretty awake immediately after surgery, but their length in recovery is the same. So in fact, there is no clinical reason to use desflurane over sevoflurane. And um, I'm really looking forward with this health pro talk next week to getting into a bit of a cage match with Baxter on this. So it's, there's no reason to use it. And I would really say that it's unethical to be using it once you know how destructive it is for the atmosphere. Plus it's more expensive. So the taxpayer is paying more, no better clinical outcomes. 
I hope I didn't waffle on that. <laughs> oh, that was great. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. Um, we have another question for Dr. Green. So in your primary care practice, do you ever advocate for sustainable changes directly to your patients? And what sorts of things would you discuss if so? Great question. It is actually something that we are starting to engage with like this minute. Um, uh, we received a, a small grant from the city of Toronto to we, what we proposed was um, patient and community engagement on climate and health. So um, we are sending our first um, uh, patient communication this week, um, um, broadly about um, climate change and health and heat, uh, and then also meter dose inhalers just for Earth Week um, and like uh, patient friendly communication, like talk to your doctor if you use this kind of inhaler and think about switching. Um, and then of course we've been doing like parallel education and QI initiatives on um, making that switch with the, the providers, um, pharmacists and nurses in our, in our clinic. Um, and then we are putting on three webinars um, that will be broadcast to the community and our patients. Um, so the first will be um, climate change and health and heat. Um, so um, like making it really practical about how to protect yourself from the heat, but also, you know, talking broadly about um, climate and health. The second will be on um, nature and, and the benefits of nature. Um, to both well-being and health, um, and then uh, nature protection, of course, good for the planet and, and climate change. Uh, and then our third webinar will be on the health benefits of plant-rich diets, and we're doing that in conjunction with our dietitians. Um, so it's not something that uh, we've done a lot of, but uh, I'm excited to dig into it more. Um, and then while we're doing these webinars, we will also be doing provider-facing education on these topics. So um, we will be embedding in our EMR um, nature Prescriptions, which is led um, by my fellow CAPE board member, Dr. Melissa Lem in Vancouver. She is the medical director for the Park RX program, which you can look up, um, where doctors can write a prescription uh, for nature. There's an evidence-based dose of uh, two hours a week, 20 minutes at a time. Um, and then in the BC program, patients actually have free access then to, to the parks, the BC parks. We don't have that yet in Ontario, but um, that's a great program. And then um, we will also be doing provider education around plant-rich diets and like the reasons to, um, uh, you know, to, uh, advise our patients to adopt plant-rich diets, plant-rich, not plant-based. Um, you know, if you look at the Eat Lancet report, on um, what constitutes a healthy diet for both individuals and the planet. It's a plant-rich diet, which isn't, doesn't mean it's, um, there's no meat, because um, of course we need to be culturally appropriate uh, and safe, um, but uh, plant-rich, anyways. Yeah. That's awesome, thanks Dr. Green. Um, so we're gonna end with one a quick question for Dr. Rao, and I think this one is asking about how are you? How do you stay motivated when you face barriers? When you're trying to advocate for change and you're kind of always pushing against, you know, barriers. How do you stay motivated? Hopefully, we can end on some, uh, maybe, so uh, a note of hope, I guess, before we uh, end off. Uh, that's a really good question. I think um, uh, this is kind of maybe funny, but you know, and other, you know, it, wherever I am, so I'm on a dragon boat team and I decided to become the sustainability person. So we started having all, I just people were bringing um, Gatorade, uh, packaged Gatorade bottles and water bottles. And I just said, no, we can't do this. So I actually measure my day to day on how much plastic waste I say, save and how much carbon emissions I've saved. And it's, can be really frustrating. Barriers can be really frustrating, but I think um, it's actually for me, uh, I've really only been doing this in healthcare for about four years and it's, I really enjoy it. So I think that's part of the reason that I can stay motivated. But when you see even some improvement, we um, started a PVC reclamation diversion program, who the next speaker on May 4th, Dr. Ali Abbas, he actually started the program and we were a pilot site. And we uh, diverted 1.2 tons away from our hospital from landfill. And it took um, a year and years off my life trying to get that through. And it was really a turnkey program. It's just an excellent program if there's anyone out there who wants to start it in their hospital. 
And uh, there were so many barriers to overcome. Um, I think we're, we're almost done, right? So, so anyway, and, and, and the other thing is, I think we all have a certain degree of eco-anxiety and uh, this is my way of channeling it. That's, that's, yeah, that's a great way to, I think, end off our um, talk and I see that it's actually perfect timing because Raluca was just talking about a toolkit for eco-anxiety um, with CBC. So I think hopefully uh, we'll all be able to go back and watch that. Um, and I think she linked the toolkit in the chat. So um, would, Raluca, do you want to share any last thoughts quickly before we um, end off? Yeah, no, I'm so sorry about that, but I think um, I really hope that these new tools that are being promoted and coming up right now in the literature um, can help support individuals feel a bit more empowered to enact change. Um, and remember what I said that it doesn't, you don't need a degree in sustainability um, to start making small changes. I think the information's there, so hopefully you make use of it and hopefully you're inspired for from all of these incredible speakers that have been a part of Cascades. Thank you so much. So we're going to end off there and we just want to say thank you to our wonderful panel of speakers tonight. This was a fantastic um, session and I think everyone's leaving with a lot of different tools and links. So um, we'll try and um, uh, share some of those links as well if anyone missed them. And just as a reminder, this is recorded so you can go back and watch uh, on YouTube later if you do have you want to dive a little bit more into some of the talks. So um, thank you so much. And again, check your emails in the next few days. We're going to send the link for uh, writing your um, reflection for if you were part of the certificate series. So that's everything. Thank you so much, everyone.